You and I are going to have an informal chat over a uh, your favorite shot of adult beverage. And we're going to be discussing this novel right here, which is Wuthering Heights by Emily uh, Bronte, I believe is her name. Why did you have to put that boom out there? It's really confusing. Anyway, I call her Bronte. Uh, this was published sometime in the 1840s. Emily was 29 years old when she wrote this thing. And uh, this was her only novel. She died very young. And the introduction to this particular Signet Classics edition of Wuthering Heights um, uh, marvels, has an essay in which it marvels that this young lady could have such um, insight into the obsessive nature of humanity uh, at such a young age. And um, yeah, 29 years old is very young to uh, have written such a... Um, I'll call it an intricate novel, um, but that insight I don't think is especially um, um, unusual for somebody that age. Uh, I'll, I'll get back into that. Um, I am reviewing, I read this novel, I've never read this novel before. This is a first from any of the Bronte sisters. Um, I've never read this novel or any of the, of the other Bronte sister novels. I've never watched a screen adaptation of this novel. I know nothing about this story, nothing. I'm coming into it very late. So it was kind of interesting reading it with those kind of fresh eyes. Um, it takes place, speaking of this weather that we're having out here, hot and windy, it takes place in an area of the world which is called the, the, the Moors, I guess that's how it's pronounced, the Moors of, of, of the Midlands of England, um, maybe north of where George Eliot wrote. But from the descriptions, it seems a very desolate area, um, uh, very sparsely populated, always raining, always snowing, uh, rocky, craggy, mountainous almost. There's lots of ideas about the characters going out in the evening, crossing between two manors, Wuthering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange. Thrush Cross Grange, whatever. Uh, about four miles apart, which, you know, <laughs> walking around at night in, in, in those kinds of conditions is a long way. I don't want to be stuck out in that desert at night in foul weather. I don't care if I only have to walk four miles. That can be extremely hazardous. So there's a lot of episodes in this novel where characters have to walk between these two manors of that short distance. And there's a fear between some of the inhabitants of these two manors about people getting lost, people getting stuck in bogs. Um, will they make it in? Uh, there's a more than one instance of people getting sick <laughs> getting very ill when walking between these two manors and then just dying. <laughs> wow. So I'll get back into all of that here in a minute. But this weather that we're having right here, um, I guess, kind of brings to mind that kind of, of foul weather. I mean, I've, I've never been to that area of England. Um, I'm but that, so it's kind of an area and the description was very important to me because I'm not familiar with that area, but it sounds very desolate. It sounds like an area that is amenable to um, hauntings, spirits and ghosts and specters and witches and the characters, all of the characters in this novel um, really bring up witches and witchcraft and ghosts quite a bit. They are all firm believers in this. Well, before I get any further into discussing this video, I want to say that I am reading or I'm reading this novel on the suggestion of the channel Libby's Lit. Libby's Lit. Libby has uh, uploaded about four videos discussing this very novel in some depth, in some, um, yeah, in some, in some depth. And look, guys, she's only got nine subscribers, nine, and her videos are awesome. So it's the type of booktube fair that, uh, you know, a certain small audience enjoys. So if you enjoy these long form discussions, 
you know what to do. Her link to her channel is in the description of this video. So I am reading this novel entirely on her suggestion. Thank you, Libby. I enjoyed it. Um, now, with that said, let's talk about the novel. I don't want to talk about the plot of Wuthering Heights. I think there's a lot of other videos out there that will give you a, a basic understanding of the plot. Let's talk about what some of the thoughts that I had. Again, I apologize. I did not outline this stuff very at all. I'm just going to go through my notes. I think the opening, let's talk about the opening of this novel. I think the opening of this novel was brilliant. The opening, let's say five chapters of Wuthering Heights, was a, a, a very smart way to open this chapter in it. We meet Mr. Lockwood, who is stranded out on these moors, fighting the foul weather, when he comes across the manor of Wuthering Heights. And he goes in, and he sees all of these foul people, inhospitable, crude, uneducated, lots of dogs. There must be five dog attacks in the opening chapters of this novel. Uh, <laughs> attacking poor Mr. Lockwood. <laughs> poor Mr. Lockwood uh, gets a room from the owner, um, whom is called Heathcliff. He gets a room that appears to be haunted by a ghost named Catherine. And oh my gosh, what is going on in this manner with these crude people, with these hauntings, with the peculiar way that poor Mr. Lockwood is being treated. They're not even having the basic amenities of hospitality for him. Mr. Lockwood looks in a chair and says, hey, nice kitty, and he looks at it and it's a bunch of dead rabbits. No explanation given. And so the reader, me, was reading this going, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Which is what Mr. Lockwood asks himself. What the hell is going on here? So he goes to an elderly housekeeper named Nellie. And Nellie says, let me tell you how things got this way. Let me tell you the story of these two families in this manner. And so that opening hook as to the showing the, the, the peculiar queerness of these two families and Wuthering Heights leads me to wonder how this happened. And then we go back in time with the story of how all of this craziness came together. I thought the opening was very smartly done. Now from there, the novel, to me anyway, got very disappointing. Basically, what this novel is about is really two things. Overarching. It's about many things, but the overarching ideas that I got from this story is that this is the story of two families. The Earnshaw and the Linton families. Both of these families are familiarly interrelated. That's a nice way of saying there's a lot of incest going on, mostly between cousins. So for instance, um, for instance, uh, Linton, or um, yeah, Linton marries Catherine, who are young Catherine, who are cousins. Uh, Isabella marries Heathcliff, Heathcliff being, let's say, a foster son, not strictly incest. But then there is later on in this novel an inference made of Linton being um, the uh, son of Isabella and her brother Edgar. The idea is that everybody think, thinks this is Heathcliff's son. But Linton doesn't look like he, his presumed father, doesn't act like his presumed father. And the presumed father sure as hell doesn't have any affection for Linton. And then the implication is made that and this is actually the offspring of a brother and sister, uh, an incestual uh, um, uh, relationship. 
So there's a, there's, there are inferences of incest between these two families. And the net result of that is that these two families come to, come to an end. This novel, Wuthering Heights, chronicles the end of these two families, the Earnshaw family and the Linton family, where there are no more children. And the survivors at the end of this novel are going to die childless. They're going to die without children of their own. These two family trees are coming to a, a grinding halt through intermarriage um, and with a lot of intermarriage between them. And the other overarching theme that I think gets most attention is through the character of Heathcliff, who is essentially a foster child of the Earnshaw family, who is treated like trash from um, Hindley and Catherine, who are the two uh, real blood children of old Mr. Earnshaw, because, you know, uh, Hindley resents having this uh, foster son um, in, in the family. Um, it is stated that Heathcliff is a foster son, but he was named Heathcliff after a previous child who died. So you can imagine Hindley's thinking, uh, this is just a replacement child for my real brother who, who died tragically. They gave him the same name, Heathcliff. All of the children have names that begin with H. Uh, Harriton, Hindley, Heathcliff, etc. So, you know, he's just kind of being jackhammered into the family. Um, now, I got to be careful with what I say because a lot of times, I, I personally, I try on these book review videos to not discuss too much of my personal life. And in this instance, with the discussion of Wuthering Heights, too much discussion will reveal a lot of my personal life, in this case regarding foster children. So I don't want to talk too much about that, how that affects me, because that will reveal too much of my personal life. I'll just leave it to say that I understand what it is like to have foster children wedged in with real children. It doesn't always go well. And this novel chronicles that very well. But then Heathcliff goes on to, what's the right word? To become vengeful? To become obsessive? To get revenge? To get his comeuppance? No, I don't think any of those are quite the right words. It is true that Heathcliff, who was once treated like garbage as the foster child of the Earnshaws, does end up eventually owning, going on to be a landed gentry and own Wuthering Heights and the neighboring Thrushcross Grange. He does go on to have both families intermarry in a way in which Heathcliff will then gain all of the inheritance of both properties. Yes, all of that is true. Harriton, you know, the Earnshaw family, the Linton, the Linton family, not only are they the last in the line, the younger generation, the last in the line of their families, but they are brought to utter ruin and under the control of Heathcliff by the end of the novel. So you're left wondering, how did Heathcliff get this way? How did, how did he become so vengeful? And this is where the novel kind of loses me. In one way, it's intriguing because it is not mere revenge. He didn't go out in my opinion, to get revenge. It's almost as if the course of events unfolded such that he could gain power over the families of Earnshaw and Linton. But he didn't scheme and maneuver to gain that leverage over him. It just happened. People in both families just conveniently died which left him 
more and more power. For instance, Hindley married Francis. Francis um, had a boy named Harriton, and Francis just died. She got weak and died. The same with Isabella. Isabella ended up marrying Heathcliff. Did Heathcliff maneuver to have Isabella Linton marry him? No, no, no. Isabella said that she, when she was very young, hey, that Heathcliff is hot stuff. I got a crush on him. And Catherine didn't like that. In fact, there's one chapter. It was like the Real Housewives of Wuthering Heights where Catherine... Earnshaw and Isabella Linton are just bitching back and forth about you know, their their love for Heathcliff and Heathcliff doesn't like you she like he likes me and on and on it was ridiculous Heathcliff wasn't involved in any of that stuff he didn't maneuver it's just that these young ladies decided they wanted to fight over him because he was you know, wild and rugged, more rugged than any of the landed gentry there at Wuthering Heights. Catherine wanted to be wild and free, just like Heathcliff, apparently. So yeah, they were <laughs> so they were fighting over him. Heathcliff had nothing to do with that maneuvering and scheming, in other words. It just kind of happened. And then, after Isabella and Heathcliff got married, well... Uh, they had a boy named Linton, at least uh, um, apparently <laughs> had a boy. And then what happens? Well, Isabella is treated very poorly by Heathcliff. Because Heathcliff, uh, you know, smacked her around and was very, very abusive towards Isabella. Heathcliff never liked Isabella. Isabella initiated the contact, but Heathcliff took advantage of that, married her, had a child and then just was totally abusive to the point where Isabella had to leave to London to raise a uh, little Linton on her own. None of this had anything to do with, with, with Heathcliff's scheming. One of two things happened. One of two things happened with Heathcliff that really disappointed me, made this novel uninteresting to me. Things just happened for instance, Catherine dies, Francis dies, Isabella dies, eventually um, uh, Edgar Linton dies. They, they, they just die. And then when, when, when these characters die, just more family control falls into Heathcliff, Heathcliff's lap. Unless Heathcliff went and poisoned these guys without our knowing, well, Heathcliff didn't do anything. They just died, and just by happenstance, all this power followed onto him. In other words, Heathcliff didn't do any scheming. He didn't do doing any maneuvering. He's not evil in that sense. Stuff just happened to him. The other mechanism that Heathcliff used to gain power was just being a bully. For instance, he bullied uh, his uh, parent, son, Linton, uh, to marry young Catherine um, uh, there are two Catherines in this novel, but he bullied Linton to marry young Catherine. You marry her. You tell her. You tell her that you two are going to get married, or I'm going to beat the hell out of you, son. <laughs> and then little Linton's uh, such a pussy that he he caves. He's pusillanimous. He's sick. He's weak. And so, yes, 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 we'll get married. Please marry me or my, or, or my father will beat me. And then as soon as they get married, he dies. Again, another character who just dies. So Heathcliff doesn't strike me as particularly vengeful. I don't think he's clever enough to be vengeful. He's just a bastard. He's just a big bully who happens to be really lucky <laughs> and have happenstance happen to him. And if, if that doesn't work, well, he's just going to beat people up. He's just going to intimidate people. And I find that boring. I find that boring uh, as a novel. It reminds me of a just a reality television show. I'm sorry. It reminds me of let's just install cameras all over, <laughs> all over Wuthering Heights and just watch the action. 
Some chapters, like chapter 8 and chapter 11, I believe, are just preposterous. Everybody yelling and bickering, people smacking each other, characters beating their heads against trees because they're driven mad, characters drinking themselves to, you know, damn nearly to death, characters dropping babies off of the top floors of banisters. <laughs> It's a little over the top. It's a little over the top to make a clever story. It's just kind of blunt force happenstance that I don't find particularly interesting as a reader. It's just, okay, let's just see who Heathcliff's going to beat up this time. And I find that kind of... It's kind of the equivalent of the... What do they call that? The, 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 the deuce ex machina? The God in the machine with your plot just becomes so unwieldy that we're just going to throw a lightning bolt in there to kind of scramble things around and, and settle scores that way. You know, basically the atomic bomb to, to, to bring everything back to a base level. That's kind of what happens here. I mean, think about what would happen if all of these characters had not died by happenstance. Catherine, Linton. What if Linton did not die? Heathcliff would not inherit all that property from Thrushcross Grange. What if Francis would not have died so suddenly? Well, um, you know, Hindley would not have become an alcoholic in all likelihood and driven himself, uh, or part of Harriton, he would have not become an alcoholic and just, um, you know, given up his power and his authority that way. What would have happened if Isabella had not died? Well, he never. Well, she would have reared Linton in London. The end of the story. You know, it's it's in, in other words, these all of these convenient deaths, convenient plot wise, had to occur in order for the for Heathcliff to get his seeming revenge. There's no cleverness in any of it. It's just a blunt club, and I find it boring frankly i did not enjoy that now with all of that said i did enjoy the second part of this novel it's like the second half of this novel is when the younger generation of characters are with heathcliff young catherine young linton young harriton uh hindley older catherine edgar isabella they're all dead they're all gone so only the younger generation is with Heath, Heathcliff. And now, of course, Heathcliff is going to have authority in, in, in this manner. And pardon me, time for a shot, guys. I've been talking a long, long time. Time for a shot of tequila. Join me, please. Oh, yeah. I can't talk and drink a shot of alcohol like that at the same time. I'll start coughing. Oh, that's good stuff. It calms me down. Today was a rough day at work, guys. So this helps. So I did like the second half of this novel quite a bit more where you've got the younger generation. And Heathcliff, by this point, is the only remaining of the older generation. He is the foster child. And this is where we get more hauntings, where he begins to think about um, Catherine, Catherine Earnshaw, who was kind of like a, we'll call her a teenage love, who had also died. And Catherine was the one young lady who did not treat Heathcliff like dirt when he was a young foster boy, when he was adopted from Liverpool. Everybody else treated him like dirt because he didn't look the same. He was a foster boy. You know, he was, what do they call him, a dark gypsy, I think. Um, you know, just treated him like a servant boy, worked out in the stables, that's all they'd let him do. You know, really not cool. But he and Catherine, Heathcliff and Catherine, why they'd go out into the moors and they would have adventures. And um, Catherine used to say, you know, she, she loved being with Heathcliff to be wild and free, not, you know, this landed gentry. And so they did fall in love, but Catherine died. And for the remainder of the novel, Heathcliff is very obsessed. He locks people in rooms against their will. He locks one of the maids, Nellie, 
uh, in, in one of the rooms for like five days. It's just crazy <laughs> because he's just very, very manipulative, very obsessive. And again, there's no planning on his life. I mean, what, what, what cleverness is involved with just locking somebody in a room for five days? It's, you're just being a bully, that's all. And I don't like reading that stuff. Anyway, I did like the second part of this batter because we brought back the idea of hauntings, of specters and ghosts, which I kind of like. A large portion of this novel I was reading, wondering who Heathcliff was. Because again, he is a foster child. He was brought in. He was different from everybody else. And the supernatural element is brought in immediately where, you know, the, 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 the tenant, the guest who was staying in Catherine's old room, sees ghosts of Catherine and feels her cold arm on his hand. And it's terrifying. Oh my God, we're seeing ghosts. And Heathcliff appears to be obsessed with this ghost of this long lost love named Catherine. So early on, we're introduced to ghosts and specters. And there's a couple of other scenes that kind of hint at weird things going on. For instance, a dog who is hung is found. In the middle of the night, horse, horses are heard. Now, explanations are given, but as I'm reading that, I'm thinking hauntings out in the moors in the wind and the snow and the rain. What am I doing hearing horses carriages while I'm looking at a hung dog? Oh my God, this is really terrifying. If I saw that out in the moors, if I saw that out in the, in the desert by myself in the middle of the night, damn right I'd be scared. This place is haunted. <laughs> so those hints are dropped, sprinkled in throughout this novel, but there's a large chunk where the, the, the gothic aspect, the haunting aspect is dropped, but it's brought back at the end with a vengeance where Heathcliff digs up the grave of Catherine and wishes to be with her throughout all of eternity, where he wishes to be with his long lost uh, uh, girlfriend Catherine in damnation rather than be with himself. Uh, be by himself with, uh, you know, <laughs> the rest of the Earnshaws, like Hindley up there in paradise. Uh, yeah, I can respect that. <laughs> I can totally dig that. Uh, I like those portions of the novel, those, those weird kind of haunting. And as I was reading those portions, especially early on in this novel, I was wondering who Heathcliff was. As a matter of fact, is he from the netherworld? Is he, in fact, the devil? Could be. Did he make at least a pact with the devil, some kind of uh, agreement with him, some kind of deal with him? Those thoughts went through my head because I'm trying to figure out why Heathcliff is acting the way he is outside of that natural aspect. Could he be from the other world? And with all of that said, again, I'm gonna come back to the personal part of reading this novel where it's it I said earlier that it reminds me a lot of you know the real housewives of of Wuthering Heights it was just over the top it's it was like a reality TV show it was just you know again people hitting each other throwing things at each other throwing curses um, locking each other in rooms and beating each beating heads on trees it just you know but coming back to my personal life, I mean, it seems over the top. It seems crazy. People don't really act like this, do they? Right. Well, coming back to my personal life, no, I am not from the moors of the Midlands of England. I've never been there. But this is my home. I'm from the deserts. Of New Mexico and I know what it is like to grow up. not not a nice resort like a Taos or something I'm talking remote I know what it's like to be raised in a place in the middle of nowhere completely isolated no neighbors no law enforcement no communications 
and I know what goes on in places like that. Without going too far into my personal life, I'll just leave it like that. Is this novel over the top? In an environment like that? No. I'll just leave it there. So anyway, Libby's Lit. Thank you for encouraging me to read Wuthering Heights. I have very mixed feelings about it. I can see why it is popular. It definitely brings up ideas and thoughts. I thought of some things that I'm sure other people will have other things to think about. It is not a long novel. My edition was about 300 pages that I polished off in about a week um, during, you know, after work. Um, not long at all, but it is packed. It is condensed. It is not overly descriptive like George Eliot. It's nothing like George Eliot. Um, um, so uh, very mixed feelings about it. I wouldn't say it's my favorite novel, but I did enjoy it, although it was at times quite maddening <laughs> and quite dull, especially with... I, I just wish Heathcliff would have been more clever in his, uh, in his revenge tour, and he was not as obsessive. I just It, it was just too much of a blunt uh, club with him, and that, that's basically it. So anyway, thank you for listening to sharing uh, your thoughts with me about Wuthering Heights. Thank you for listening to mine. Thank you for having a shot of your uh, favorite adult beverage with me. Let's have one more. Ooh, that one went up my nose. Okay, and thank you again. Remember, Libby's Lit. Check her channel out, and you all take care. Bye-bye.